The Great Wall is one of the major symbols of ancient China, and a large number of ancient Chinese dynasties have invested heavily in building it. But how effective was the Great Wall really? In this video, I will explain some of the key roles it served for ancient China, militarily, politically, and economically. I will also use the Roman Empire as a comparison to illustrate some of these points. First, we need to be clear what is the Great Wall. It was not just a single wall, but a series of border fortifications. In sparsely populated areas, it may have been nothing more than a thin wall several meters high manned by the occasional guard, but in more populated, important areas, it included all kinds of fortifications like fortresses, advanced guard towers, military camps, and supply depots. The Great Wall was not built on just any terrain, but more specifically along the 400mm rainfall line, north of which rainfall is so sparse that only nomadic lifestyle could be supported, and settled agriculture could not be supported. The wall separated not just two governmental regimes, but two drastically different ecological systems and ways of life. Militarily, the wall served as a force multiplier for the ancient Chinese dynasties against nomadic invasions. Without the wall, the dynasties would have needed to produce large numbers of cavalry to match the mobility of the nomadic raiders and then actively patrol the frontier with them. Unfortunately, most ancient Chinese dynasties were quite awful at raising the horses needed to build a cavalry, and it was also very expensive to train horsemen to compete against nomads who had spent most of their lives on horseback anyway. The wall made it much easier to defend the frontier with infantry. Most of the wall was only sparsely guarded, and in and of itself did not prevent raiders from crossing. But what it did do was prevent small bands of raiders from crossing with their horses, limiting the damage they caused even if they did sneak across the wall. And to cross the wall with their horses, the nomadic tribes first needed to gather a large force to launch a coordinated attack. This gave scouts extra time to alert other defenders that an attack was coming. In this sense, the wall functioned like a dam, which adequately protects against small floods and is designed to overflow against large floods, buying time for the people living downstream to prepare. If a large nomadic force were to gather for an invasion, the wall still significantly limited their point of attack, usually to heavily defended gated mountain passes, like Juyong Pass near Beijing, that were well stocked with weapons and food supplies. Against such attacks, the wall could function as a highway for reinforcements to arrive quickly. Without the wall, Defenders from nearby fortresses may have needed to take long detours through narrow mountain roads behind the front line. But with the wall, they could quickly march directly on top of the wall to where they were most needed. And even if the nomadic army were to breach the line of the wall with their horses, they still could not raid deeply anyway because then they risked their retreat route being cut off. Unlike regular ancient Chinese city gates that were more heavily fortified on only one side, the city gates along the Great Wall were usually heavily fortified on both sides, just as much to keep invaders in as to lock them out. For the invaders, since it was usually difficult enough to breach the wall at one location, let alone more than one location, they would have needed to retreat along the same route that they entered. This allowed the defenders to prepare obstacles and ambushes along the likely retreat route. The wall itself also served as a rapid warning system for invasions. The original Mulan movie from Disney illustrates this point quite well. In the movie, the Huns scale the wall with just a few ropes, easily overwhelming the defenders, but the defenders are also able to light the nearby beacon, quickly alerting the rest of China of the invasion so that the empire could prepare. And even if the Chinese dynasties were to launch expeditions into nomadic territories, it usually required tremendous amounts of buildup and coordination to do so. The security provided by the wall allowed them to accumulate resources, often for years, before finally launching attacks when ready. Politically, the presence of the wall was a major stabilizing force for the empire. Without a wall, the peasants living in the border marches would have needed to be far more militarized, spending much more of their time in military training. This may not have been a big problem at the beginning of a dynasty, but over the course of several generations will have made it easier for the border marchers to develop their own local identities. During times of crisis in the capital, the border armies could be much more easily enticed to rebel and march onto the capital, and the border regions could much more easily form their own breakaway states. Because the wall was such a force multiplier, not only could the wall be defended by a small number of soldiers, but those soldiers often did not even need to be recruited from the frontier regions, and could have come from elsewhere in the empire, especially areas near the capital city, helping to ensure their loyalty to the emperor rather than the local elites.
And with the defender split into many small garrisons, it was also much easier to split the military command on the frontier among many low-ranking generals rather than a few powerful generals, as was the case during the Roman Principate, when the generals in Britain, Germania, the Daniel provinces, Syria, and Egypt all held significant commands. This was especially an issue for the Romans since, by tradition, Rome itself was not even supposed to be militarized. During times of peace, the emperors were able to keep their frontier generals in check. But when the emperor's authority suddenly collapsed, as was the case after Nero's death in 68 AD or the assassination of Commodus in 192, the power vacuum immediately enticed the generals to compete with one another to march onto the capital. Whereas with ancient China, despite the countless civil wars and rebellions that have taken place over the centuries, very rarely had generals stationed along the Great Wall even tried to march onto the capital. Such was the emperor's determination to keep their powers in check. The security that the Great Wall provided allowed many ancient Chinese dynasties to build their capitals close to the frontier. The most obvious case was the Ming Dynasty capital at Beijing, a frontier city. But what is less obvious is that the city of Chang'an, the great capital of the Qin, Western Han, Sui, and Tang dynasties, was also effectively a frontier city in the northwest, away from the economically rich Chinese heartlands. The benefit of doing so was that, in order to remain in power, the emperors needed to ensure the loyalty of the army. And what better way to do so than to keep the largest army in the empire near the capital, under the emperor's watchful eyes, and readily available to fight against both foreign invasions and rebellions from within? Again, using the Roman Empire as an example, during the height of the Principate, it was fine to keep Rome as the capital of the empire, far from the frontier. But during the crisis of the third century, when the emperors needed to keep the armies close by, it was no longer practical for them to rule from all the way back in Rome, and they increasingly based themselves out of cities closer to the frontier, such as Trier, Sirmium, or Mediolanum (modern-day Milan). But most of these cities, except Milan, were also located in economically less developed areas, adding additional costs to running the empire. Ultimately, the Romans found the perfect location for a new capital in Constantinople. On one hand, it was located in one of the richest parts of the empire, at the intersection of road and water traffic through the Bosporus. On the other hand, it was close to both the Danube and the Asian frontiers, where the Roman Empire faced most of its threats during the fourth century AD, allowing the emperors to keep the army nearby. Even though invaders from the Danube could still reach Constantinople quite easily by land, the Theodosian walls across the peninsula kept the city safe, serving the same role for Constantinople as the Great Wall did for Beijing during the Ming Dynasty. None of this is to argue that the Roman Empire should have built a Great Wall. There were many reasons why it could not and did not, with geography being an obvious reason. But given the bureaucratic system and unique geography already in place in ancient China. Building a wall did make sense and helped many ancient Chinese dynasties avoid some of the political instability that afflicted the Roman Empire. Going back to ancient China, the Great Wall economically allowed the Chinese dynasties to easily blockade the nomadic tribes who needed to trade for essential resources like salt and iron, as well as nice things like silk, tea, and porcelain. Oftentimes, just the threat of economic blockade alone was enough to force the nomadic tribes to make peace with the dynasties, signing trade deals in which they traded horses, which China did not produce but desperately needed in exchange for vital goods. The wall also allowed the ancient Chinese dynasties all kinds of trade leverage over the nomads. For example, it could set the price for vital goods and lower them only if the tribes play nice, or if there were more than one rival tribe, it could play them off against one another. Maybe even give access to salt and iron to one tribe while placing a trade embargo on the other. Even though nomadic cavalrys were some of the most powerful fighting forces in the ancient and medieval worlds, to really reach their full potential, they needed access to advanced technology like metalworking, engineering, and logistical organization. For example, what ultimately allowed the Mongols to conquer so much of the world was not just their military might, but the resources and technological know-how they gained from settled agricultural areas like northern China. For much of Chinese history, though. The Great Wall kept nomads like the Mongols away from these resources. The wall also allowed the peasants in the border marches to focus more on agriculture rather than having to constantly prepare for war. 
the border marches were still expensive to maintain, and large amounts of supplies still needed to be transported from the interior. But this at least somewhat reduced the costs. And for much of Chinese history, some of the wealthiest lands in China were north of the Yellow River, not far from the frontier. The Great Wall helped keep these areas safe from raiding. At this point in the video, you may be asking, if it was so expensive to keep the nomads out, then why didn't the ancient Chinese dynasties just invade and occupy the areas? The issue was that most ancient Chinese dynasties already control all the lands that could be used for agriculture. So anything north of that, north of the wall, was about as useful to them as the ocean itself. Not only that, but for almost all of the ancient Chinese dynasties, trying to occupy the steppes would have done far more harm than good. Not only would it have been prohibitively expensive to invade and then maintain an occupying force, but the nomadic nature of the steppes meant that it would have been impossible to govern the people there using the same bureaucratic system used in the rest of China, which was designed for settled agriculture. It would have been only a matter of time before the conquered nomads rebelled, and such rebellions would have been far more dangerous because, one, there's no longer a wall to keep the invaders out, and two, they would have been far more exposed to Chinese culture than they would have been otherwise, and possibly no longer even be considered barbarians, giving them a level of political legitimacy and access to technology that they would not have otherwise had. One of the worst disasters in Chinese history was the Five Barbarians Rebellion in the early 300s AD, when barbarian tribes that had already settled within the Great Wall rebelled. Trying to permanently conquer the steppes and then having the conquered people rebel would have resulted in the Five Barbarians' Rebellion on steroids. So, much simpler to just keep them out. For these reasons, almost every ancient Chinese dynasty that controlled northern China built a Great Wall. The northern Song dynasty did not, because it did not control the 16 prefectures, an area which included modern-day Beijing, so building one would have been pointless. The Yuan and Qing dynasties also did not, because they came from north of the Great Wall anyway. And the Tang dynasty also famously did not build a Great Wall, in part because in its early days during the mid-600s AD, its military was so powerful that it could get away with not building one. But what ultimately led to the downfall of the Tang dynasty were rebellions from powerful generals along the frontier. So perhaps they should have built one too. If you have enjoyed this video, please remember to hit like and subscribe below to help me grow this channel. Please also feel free to leave in the comment section if there are any topics you would like me to discuss in further videos.